All right, so this is a summary of everything. The first order is a new business model for Tesla. It undercuts rideshare. It reduces vehicle ownership. It will create economic stimulus. It increases the value of Tesla FSD capable EVs and decreases the value of everything else. When Tesla unveils a robo-taxi in August, that will kick off the beginning of the real potential for a robo-taxi future. But what are the implications? What might happen to the existing rideshare services like Uber and Lyft? What will happen to consumers buying and owning cars? Will Tesla continue to sell vehicles or might they just solely focus on the robo-taxi version? What will happen to insurance? And more importantly, what about airlines, hotels, healthcare, and real estate? I guarantee you, today's show will be one of the most complete analysis you will find of the implications of the robo-taxi future. Our guest today, Cern Basher, is a chartered financial analyst. He's currently running his own investment advisory firm called Brilliant Advice. Welcome again, Cern. Thank you so much for giving us the opportunity with your deep dive analysis here. RoboTaxi, of course, is one of the biggest topics ever since Elon announced that they're going to do the big unveil on August 8th. Thank you so much for joining me. It's great to be here, Herbert, and there's a lot of facets to this. So uh, we are very appreciative because you always come with complete analysis. You've got a full deck here that is quite, quite uh, uh, impressive. So what you've done is done a deep dive, and I'm glad somebody did this, on the implications of a robo-taxi future. And you have this thing called first, second, and third order effects. So these are things that's going to impact basically society and the world. Those are the third order effects. Uh, but this is coming fast and furious. It's really here now. Uh, tell me how you came up with this. Yeah, I've been thinking about this for a long time. And the first order effects, I think, for most of us are pretty obvious. Although I think there's some nuances to some of them that are worth talking about. But the second and third order effects, I think a lot of people find it difficult to wrap their minds around. Um, I know that I've struggled with it as well. And that this will develop over time. But there are some very significant second and third order effects. Okay. So let's get started with the deck here. Um, first, you start off with where do people live? Tell me what this is about. Yeah. So in the discussion about a potential robo taxi network, you know, Elon has said that on August 8th, we're going to unveil it. Okay. So what does that mean? Well, they'll probably tell us, you know, how they conceive constructing the network and pricing perhaps and the vehicles and so on. But we won't have an instant robo taxi network nationwide overnight. It's going to make the most sense to trial it, to start it in certain areas first. And this map shows where half of the US population lives in the blue regions and the other half is in the orange. So the blue likely is where robo taxi would would start first and then from there branch out. Now, there are uh, about 333 cities in the United States that have 100,000 or more people. And there aren't, you know, 333 squares on that on that chart. But that's where I think we'll see it start. And so I, I think a lot of people, their initial reaction is, well, okay, it's not going to work in rural areas. And that's true. It's not going to be in rural areas to start with. I know some people want robo taxis in rural areas, but that's not likely where it's going to start. You want to start in a very dense population area where there would be a lot of demand for, for these this type of service. Beautiful. Agreed. That makes so much sense. Um, and I know you've come with a lot of uh, other stats and facts, so let's get there. But first, this is from Brett Winton, ARK Invest. They're a disruptive, they're an investment firm that's really focused on disruptive technologies, led by Kathy Wood. Brett Winton said this, um, looks like it did. He posted this on April 5th, which is just three days ago. So he goes, if you sell a $25,000 car, you're going to get an optimistic $2,500 in income once. But if you deploy a robo taxi at a dollar per mile, you're going to get $25,000 in income every year annually. When Robo Taxi is worth 50 $25,000 car sales on a present value basis, indications that Tesla are more confident in the latter model, Robo Taxi, are massively positive. <laughs> this is completely changing what Tesla is all about. Lots of ways to get to this, and I encourage you to read Tasha's um, research and dig into our open source model in Tesla. 
So he goes, very rough math. A robotaxi operating 12 hours a day, 25 miles per hour, does 100,000 miles per year. There are a trillion miles addressable at more than a dollar per mile per hour research. At 50% platform fee, 50% operating margin on that net revenue, Tesla takes off $25,000 in operating earnings. Net present value difference over seven years at a 10% discount rate yields a 50 times difference. Lots of ways to get there, but obviously materially more value. This is how we come up with the math. So you and I, you've done deep dive on mm. RoboTaxi. So I encourage people, if you want to know like the actual deck and the actual slides, the actual calculations, spreadsheets, there's a previous show, multi, maybe a couple of shows that uh, CERN has done on this channel. Uh, so what, what's your thoughts on his business model? Well, I love the way he put it. He made it very simple and very clear and very short, quick math. And that's the key first order effect is that this is a massive change, a night and day change to Tesla's business model. Over time, it's not a night and day switch in terms of their revenue and profitability, you know, after August 8th, but it's very clear what this will mean for Tesla in the long run as more and more of their business shifts to this model. 50x change in the profit potential um, or the revenue potential on a per vehicle basis. It's, it's, it's staggering. Now, if you go to the next chart, Herbert, Brett's numbers, you know, it's kind of interesting also compare nicely with the work that I've done. And so uh, depending on price per mile and utilization, but if you go to the far left column, Using similar numbers to Brett Winton, I had about $25,000 in net profit at a dollar per mile. And that was only at 30% utilization. If you increase the utilization rate, that would allow Tesla to decrease the cost per mile. And I still get, you know, net profit ranging from $25,000 to $28,000 per vehicle per year. Wow, this is amazing. So it's very similar. Um, okay, let's keep going. Okay. Yeah, so next. the next big thing is clearly there's an opportunity to undercut ride share and public transportation. And this is what Brett was also talking about. Let's just focus on, on ride share. So James Dalma recently talked about some data that he obtained and analyzed from Chicago and I'm collaborating a little bit with James, although we've been so busy lately, haven't really had a chance to dig into this much yet, but I wanted to share with you what James has done and then some early work that I've done on this. So the first thing here was this, this heat map. And so you can see this is the Chicago area and the heat map shows where most of the rides take place. And certainly it would be mostly in the downtown area. Um, if you go to the next slide, mm -hmm. James Dalma suggests that you know, in, in terms of opportunity for, for Tesla and rideshare, the the average price per mile in the Chicago area is about $2.40, right? So what Brett Winton was talking about earlier there is about a dollar per mile. This is two forty. And so if there was a robotaxi that had a $20,000 cost with a 10-year life, James has calculated that that has a present value of about $800,000 or an annual profit of about $108,000. Okay. Now that's if Tesla came in and operated at basically the same average rate that, that, that Uber does. So basically just taking a robo taxi and, and being in the market with Uber and, and charging the same, the same price. So clearly there's an ability to undercut this, this, this number is four times as much as what Brett Winton and what my work shows could be the potential profit. Now, certainly in the early years, the profit potential on a per vehicle basis is very high. And over time that comes down, the overall profit grows because you've got more vehicles in the fleet. But what James is showing here is that this, you know, you, it doesn't take much to undercut what Uber and Lyft and others are doing, right? And if you just match the pricing, you'd be making $108,000 per year per, per vehicle in, in, the, in the Chicago area. So this, this shows the opportunity. Yeah. That's crazy right. that James Dalma is the one that's 
has a hundred thousand dollar per year versus you you're being more conservative because james is a machine learning expert he's very conservative but he also drilled down got the actual data from uber and lyft started doing his own analysis so it's a bit of this head scratcher that it's coming from james that he's actually being very bullish because he's not like him so it's it's yeah. interesting too anyways it doesn't matter almost right whether it's thirty thousand a year or it's a hundred thousand a year <laughs> it's so per it, year it's per year and it goes to show the, the opportunity even if you undercut uber and lyft just a little bit you know how you can imagine very quickly people would flow to that new service right and the next chart is my initial attempt at kind of parsing through some of this data and I got to say that this, this, it's like drinking from a fire, fire hose when you download this data. There's a lot of data. And I apologize for the poor formatting of these charts. Yeah. Uh, I didn't have time to format them any better. This was a, a very rushed attempt here. But I'll just talk you through this. This is showing the average cost per mile relative to trip distance. The first bar is a trip where there's zero miles. Okay, and you can see that the average cost per mile is super high. Basically, I'm not sure what's going on there. Maybe somebody got in the car and didn't go anywhere and there's still, there's still a charge. Or, or maybe it's only half a mile or something. You know, it's, it's from zero to one miles basically is that first bar. But the second bar where it shows about 750, that would be the average cost per mile if you went one mile. At two miles, the average cost per mile is about $5. Okay, and by the time you get to about five miles, the average cost per mile is about two dollars and fifty cents. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, on the short end, there, there's a lot. You know, it's a high cost per mile, and then you can see over time, or as as the trip length increases, it flattens out at about a yeah. dollar twenty five a mile. Yeah. Okay, but because most of the trips are short. The average fare, I believe, in the Chicago area is about 240 on a per mile basis. Okay. So in our models that we typically that I typically do is I assume an average distance, you know, say five miles, and then I assume an average fare, let's say a dollar or a dollar fifty a mile. So this just gives you some degree of mm -hmm. understanding in terms of how the pricing changes on a distance basis. Mm -hmm. And then if you go to the next chart. This shows uh, any given day. This is looking at about you know weeks, eight days worth, I guess, of, of data, and the number of trips per hour each day. So you can see there's peaks and valleys. So there's a lot of complexity here. I guess that's what I'm trying to say with the robot taxi network. There's a lot of complexity to it. There's going to be it's going to take some time to work out kinks, unless Tesla decides to partner with an Uber, and I hold that out as a possibility. I don't think Tesla would buy Uber. I think that's silly. But partnership potentially, and if not, then they've got some some learning to, to 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 have in terms of how many vehicles do they need in the fleet at any given time to meet these peaks and valleys, so that the customer experience is good. And mm -hmm. Uber's been at this game now for years, so they have a lot of knowledge in terms of how to operate the robo taxi network that Tesla does not have yet. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's more that we could discuss on that, but if you go to the next slide, further looking at average cost per mile in 15 minute intervals for different trip lengths. So the blue line is trips that are zero to five miles, the very short trips. And you can see the average price per mile there fluctuates between let's say 350 or $3 a mile up to seven or eight. So think about if there's a, a, a peak period, like rush hour, or a football game ends, or mm -hmm. you know, a concert ends, suddenly that, that cost per mile just skyrockets because everybody's demanding an Uber and it's just not enough to go around. And what Uber does is they institute surge pricing and they just jack up the rate to have a market clearing price. Mm -hmm. People eventually say, oh, I'm not, I'm not paying 40 bucks to go five miles. It's not, not worth it, mm -hmm. right? They walk or they take the bus. So. I also think that the robot taxi network is likely to have some kind of dynamic pricing like this as well. Right. And you can see that for longer trips, that fluctuation isn't quite as great, but it's still there. It's still very significant. Okay. So I thought that was interesting from, from this data. Great data. Yeah. Thank you.
And then the next one is shared versus non-shared rights. Mm -hmm. And I think the same thing may apply also to RoboTaxi, that if you share the ride to somebody, then your cost goes down. Uh, and that's that's pretty, pretty, pretty logical. If you want the vehicle to yourself, fine, no problem. Mm -hmm. But if you yeah. also want to share it with somebody else, that's great. Yeah, Lyft has that in their app. You can decide if you want, you don't mind it being shared, mm -hmm. and then they'll pick up other passengers, strangers. Yeah. That's okay. Mm -hmm. So I get a lot of comments and people say, well, a dollar per mile is too much or 50 cents per mile is too much. Well, okay. But if you share it with somebody, it might be half of that or a third of that. Mm -hmm. Is that too much? If it's only 20 cents a mile, 15 cents a mile for you, it's probably pretty, pretty reasonable at that point. Right? So pretty ridiculous. Yeah. Right. So you just have to think about all the different possibilities. It's not just, you know, a single person in a robo taxi. There's, there's other ways of, of doing this and Uber and Lyft our masters are doing this. Mm -hmm. Okay. So again, I'm just getting into this data. There's, there's a lot to it. I'll have some prettier charts at some point and some, some more information, but, but thanks to James for, for kind of, uh, you know, starting that conversation. I think looking at Uber and Lyft, I think will be, will be very instructive. And to James's point, you don't really have to undercut them much if, if at all, in order to capture a decent size of the market. And ARK invest here is sort of showing a similar thing. So depending on the price per mile, you capture different segments of the market. And as the price per mile comes down, the segment of the market that you capture becomes larger and larger and larger. Right. So for the existing addressable market for ride hail companies at a cost of between two and four dollars per mile, that's a $34 billion opportunity, according to ARK Invest. Okay. But if you can get the price down to a dollar per mile, then that's an additional trillion dollar opportunity. And then you get the non-commuting miles in higher income countries priced at 60 cents per mile. That's another 2.4 trillion of market opportunity. And then you get prices of 50 cents per mile in lower income countries. That's another 2.75 trillion. And then long-term $5 trillion opportunity and low cost accessible autonomous travel at 25 cents per mile. So we will start on the left side and as the network gets built up, more vehicles in the network, pricing will come down and the market size will just expand and expand and expand. Now, this is an existing market opportunity. What happens with everything, when you lower the price, you get more of it, more demand. And I don't know if that's fully taken into account here. I doubt that it is. So chances are these numbers are pretty conservative. Oh, for sure. Right. But the size of this market opportunity is just enormous. Massive. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so when we think then about disrupting rideshare, that's great, but it's also public transportation. Yeah. Okay. When I take a train, trains are cheap but I have to get to the train station and the train may not take me exactly to where I want to go. Yeah. Right. And if I miss the train, then I have to wait for the next one or same thing with the bus. I have to wait out in the cold and the rain and the snow, wait for the bus. If I miss it, I got to wait more time. The bus doesn't take me where I want to go. So this is the opportunity for autonomous vehicles. They can take you from point A to point B without going to all those different places in between and having to wait and all that. And it's the same thing for school buses, right? I think a lot of parents may opt to put their kids in a robo taxi. They certainly won't be bullied by any other kids, right? And they wouldn't have to spend as much time on a school bus. And they could also, after school, be taken from school directly to the sport mm -hmm. that they're playing. Yeah. Instead of having to sit on a bus or the parent having to go to school and then drive the kid all around. like. There's so many sort of convenience opportunities here in, in addition to yeah. the cost savings potential yeah. that a lot of people will opt for. So yeah. no doubt a massive opportunity to disrupt public transportation. Yeah. Farzad uh, did a post and he said that, um, yeah, Robotaxi will disrupt public transportation, something like that. And Elon replies saying, you know, yes, <laughs> yeah. very likely. Yeah. Now, it's interesting, if you look at a subway map, so on the left side there is, is New York. Massive network of trains, you know, pretty amazing system. Very good system, yeah. 
but if you want to get to different points where those lines don't go, you it's going to be kind of a complicated journey. Right? Tokyo, top right, incredible subway system. Right? And it may be harder to disrupt a system like Tokyo, but not many cities have a subway system like Tokyo does. No. Yeah. Okay. But look at the lower right. This is mm -hmm. Las Vegas, the boring tunnel mm -hmm. network. Why not build the subways underground and have autonomous vehicles operate? So for cities that haven't invested billions and billions of dollars in subway train systems, they will have an opportunity to invest probably some less money in underground autonomous pipelines. And that frees up the city on the street level from all the congestion of transportation. So this plays right into the strategy for the boring company as well. Oh my gosh, that's brilliant. Yeah, we know the subways right. work. I mean, obviously the New York and Tokyo, fantastic. I've obviously used them all. They're amazing. And I don't, it's not going to be disrupted by RoboTaxi per se necessarily, uh, because it's just so efficient at people moving, but many cities don't have it, like you said. And so then if they wanted it, they're likely to do boring tunnel. They're likely to do autonomous. It just makes so much sense. The cost will plummet and it's just going to be even more effective. And I, remember the, the the video that uh, Elon once did a long time ago where the cars can actually emerge mm -hmm. from the underground tunnel. I, I can't mm -hmm. see this. They emerge from underground tunnel and then all of a sudden they can drive off in the street. So it's yeah. not like, you know, it's like a bunch of ants who are all going through one, but if they wanted to, they can come out and they can go off and take you to your own destination. So it's like fast freeway and then up and go and fantastic ideas yeah so that that's coming as well that's that's further down the road but that's also coming yeah okay now the other big thing is bringing up cities from pollution yeah and congestion right and and it'll make cities more livable more desirable places to be Right, so this massive push that we have of people living out in the suburbs because those are desirable, less polluted, less congested, that trend might reverse in time because now you live in a quiet city core that is, you know, the air is breathable and so on. So that will be an interesting thing to see over time as well, right? And it might result in shorter commute times because people walk or bike or take an autonomous vehicle to work and it's much closer. So I think it could improve the livability of cities. For sure. Okay. All right. It also undercuts vehicle ownership. If you have an incredible, efficient, low cost autonomous network, why, why own a vehicle? And for many people, they will choose not to. And we're already seeing this, I think, in survey data for a younger generation. You know, if many of them don't want to own a vehicle, right? They just they just want transportation as a service. And so, the implications of this are kind of interesting, and that's kind of some of the second and third order impacts, right? But if you look at the next chart, the amount of money that people spend on transportation is rather large. Mm -hmm. On average, the average American spends about $10,000 a year on transportation. And that includes the mm -hmm. cost of the vehicle, public transit, insurance, gasoline, that kind of thing. And this is broken out by different income levels. Mm -hmm. Right. So if somebody making $200,000 or more, it could be spending 13% of their income. That's, that's a pretty big number. Right. Um, and, and so on. So there's, if people will act in their economic interest, if there's an ability for them to save money, many of them will opt for that ability. Right. So this, this is an important consideration as well. I know a lot of people talk about, well, I love the drive. I like the convenience of having my own car. I don't want to wait for a robo taxi. Well, many of those things will be solved by the structure of the network. You can get a robo taxi to show up whenever you want it to show up. You can just pre book mm -hmm. it. It'll show up exactly when you want it. Right, much like you can do today with an Uber, you don't just have to go to the app and wait. You can you can pre pre book it. But if you could save five thousand dollars a year, most people would do that. That's a significant amount of money, 
and and the way to think about that is if you look at the next chart, it's a massive amount of economic stimulus. It's like somebody giving you back wow. five thousand dollars. So, yeah, we've seen what happened when they did right? that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. And so what what happened? Yeah. Right, you spend it somewhere else. So yeah. for, for anybody that's not in the transportation business today, they should be cheering for this because that money will come to them. Right. You've suddenly now taken five thousand dollars that somebody spent on transportation and they're gonna spend it on everything else. So this is every year. <laughs> every yeah. year. Yeah. That's right. And, and I was saying earlier that, over time. Yeah. You, you, there's going to be various kinds of robo taxi. People right now they imagine it to be this stark, you know, um very simplistic kind of thing, minimalistic, but you can have luxury. You know, just like you have now, where you have a black car pick you up, all the uh, very wealthy people, they will have black cars, limousines pick them up. You can have a really decked out, just <laughs> want an experience that could be, right? If you're willing to to really go That's for right. that road. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so again, don't underestimate the power of this, right? You put people, put money back into everybody's pocket. They're mm -hmm. going to spend it now on something else. So. It's, it could create a bit of an economic boom over time from that repurposed money. Okay. We've talked about this before. The other thing that this does is it makes the value of any vehicle that is capable of autonomy, FSD capable, it increases the value of them. And I've done some work on that. Depending on your assumptions, you're looking at 40 to, you know, a doubling of the vehicle's value a 40% increase to a doubling of the vehicle's value, maybe even more depending on your assumptions. Either way, it's a significant increase because it turns a depreciating machine into a money printing machine, right? And whether that's $25,000 a year or 108,000, who knows that the opportunity to make money with an autonomous capable vehicle is there. And this also points to the need for other automakers to make their vehicles FSD capable, i.e. license the technology because they want their cars to become money-making machines and not just depreciating machines. Because if they, if they only sell depreciating machines, the value of those will depreciate even further because they become useless to people. Yeah, this is important to the, for us to just pause for a second and think about it. So let's, let's carry this forward. If Tesla comes out with FSD capable vehicles, whether or not you decide to put in a robo taxi network or you don't, it's capable of FSD. You've pointed out that lots of people come knocking on the door going, hey, let me buy it for you. And I'm going to buy it three times what it is worth now, even more based on what it can do for them. Mm -hmm. But then what will happen to the other automakers who are continuing to pump out brand new cars that are not FSD capable? Their prices will fall. And yeah. what they will be like, you should, but basically what you're saying now, it's going to be tremendous pressure for them to try to make, like, why would you create cars that are not capable of this in the future? So people right. will just flock to buy the ones that are capable. Even if they don't buy it, they don't want to pay the extra cash for it, right? Quite yet. The value is worth more. Yeah. Three times as much. Now, yeah, so, what might happen in the short term, though, is that there might be a glut of these unwanted vehicles. So the prices of those vehicles could come way down. I see. Right. But that's depreciation for the owners of them. Yeah. But for somebody who wants to buy a, a cheap ICE vehicle, they might be right. able to for a period of time. Gotcha. But eventually okay. what happens is the other OEMs scale back their businesses. And actually we'll, we'll get to that here in the next, next slide. Um, we're all aware of economies of scale as automakers scale their business. Right, yeah. they they make more money to cover those fixed costs, but there's also diseconomies of scale. Nice. So yeah. in the simple analysis here, just working this backwards, if a car costs a hundred thousand dollars to make, and you make five cars, the cost per unit is twenty. Yeah. So instead of going from left to right, you're going to be going from right to left on this little table. Yeah. Right. So. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's a very significant thing, and a lot of automakers are going to find themselves underwater very quickly, potentially. And, and just to underline that point, on the next chart is a visual of GM's business model. Mm -hmm. Their operating profit, this is the fourth quarter of last year, their operating margin is like 5%. 
Yeah, right. easily remove or take it just gone. It could be gone pretty quickly. And then what do they yeah. do? <laughs> right. So oh, they gosh. don't have a whole lot of wiggle room here. So if, if volumes yeah. start to fall off for any reason because their cars are not in demand, because they're not autonomous capable, why would people buy a GM? This company finds themselves underwater very quickly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, contrast that with Ferrari on the next page. Now, there will be some people who want to own their own vehicle. It's a status symbol. And I think the cost of status is going to go up mm -hmm. if, if that's yeah. your definition of status. Mm -hmm. Now, Ferrari has a very different model than GM. They're not focused on volume. They're focused on profit. So if Ferrari sells their car for 300000 they're making about 150000 in profit. Yeah. Okay. Maybe demand for Ferraris goes up. I, I don't think they would necessarily be too impacted. But the problem is that yeah. they have is that an autonomous vehicle is kind of a premium feature. And if they don't have that capability, then, you know. Mm, I think it's but, okay. But I think Ferraris are meant to be driven. Like people want to drive a yeah. Ferrari, not just sit yeah. in a Ferrari. So this, this company may be an exception, but there's not many companies in Ferrari's position. Agreed. Yep. Okay. So big changes coming down the way for automakers. All right. Let's talk about insurance. This is a bit of a convoluted picture. In the end, I think insurance companies are fine, but the transition is really messy. One of the biggest problems that I see is this whole uninsured motorist problem. And I live in Florida where it's estimated that perhaps 25% of the drivers don't what? have insurance. What? Yeah. Are you kidding me? Pretty scary, right? Oh and my gosh. Her, I didn't realize Herbert, I live in Washington. 17% yeah. are uninsured. Well, what do you mean? How is that possible? What? Yeah. So insurance has already gotten so expensive. Yeah. That a lot of people say, I can't afford it, but I still need to drive and get to work. I see. Right. We also have plenty of immigrants into this country that, that just don't care. Can't mm -hmm. afford it. Don't, mm -hmm. don't care. Take the risk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we're, but the people that are buying insurance, we're all paying for this. Okay. So if we get to a point where robo taxis are the safest vehicles on the road, insurance companies are going to say, well, the humans go in the high risk pool. We need to jack up the costs on them. So that will drive more people to become uninsured because they can no longer afford insurance. And that could make, you know, it quite dangerous on the roads if you've got, you know, more and more people who don't have insurance. So I pose the question about whether this is the final straw that eventually causes governments to ban people from driving on the roads or at least certain roads, right? You can't drive a car on the interstate if you are a human driver, only autonomous vehicles on the interstate, something like that, right? I could see a situation where that might be possible. The other thing too, to think about is EVs right now are more costly to repair. So as we have more and more EVs on the road, the cost of the insurance companies go up. So maybe the number of accidents goes down, but the costs could still increase further putting pressure on insurance pricing. Now, insurance companies are, they've been around for centuries. They're really smart, data-driven companies. They will adjust to all this just, just fine. But I'm a little bit concerned kind of as we transition what could happen to insurance rates and what could happen to the amount of uninsured people and how that impacts the rest of us. Yeah, you know, this is another one of those topics that we need to sit back and pause and really think through. If I am Tesla and I have a Tesla car and it has, even if it's not RoboTaxi ready, but it's got ADAS, super ADAS, right? This ability to, to be much safer than any car mm -hmm. out there because it can, even if you don't turn on uh, full self-driving, it has, you know, evasive maneuvers. It has this ability to not hit anything because it's got the eight cameras. Um, my insurance should go down, mm -hmm. uh, but... Then the question is, what happens to uh, all the gas cars out there? What happens to their insurance? What happens to other car makers who don't have uh, this feature? What happens to their insurance? And then what happens over time? That's very interesting, CERN. Yeah. And, and even though your insurance should go down because your car is safer, and if it's autonomously driven, it's even safer, mm -hmm. the cost to repair your car should it ever get hit 
could be it's the a same lot higher. Model, though. But it is now that I already have my Tesla now. I, there's already EVs now. There's already 10% you, of cars on the US as EVs. Uh, for you as an individual, yes. But as the number of EVs in the pool gets bigger and bigger, the total uh, sure. repair costs become larger. Hmm. Right. And that's what the insurance companies are looking at is the risk pool. So the nature mm -hmm. of that risk pool changes is what I'm trying to say. And I, I don't quite know how that's going to play out. Yeah. But I have some concerns about what may happen to insurance costs during that transition. I'm, but I'm saying that if you have an EV plus FSD, then your insurance will go down. And so therefore, if you're an EV that don't have insurance, uh, FSD, then you're, you're, you got a lot of pressure to go ahead and partner with Tesla. Yeah, I think uh, so. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, there's so many moving parts there. We yeah. should just dive deep in that one. Interesting. Now, this is the beautiful benefit. Ultimately, we're going to save lives by going autonomous. Humans are absolutely terrible drivers. Yeah. Right. Like, let's not deceive ourselves. We, we have the illusion of control when we drive a vehicle. Right. We all think we're better than everybody else. But the reality is, in this country, 44, 42,000 people are dying every year. Mm -hmm. um, this is up to 2022, 2023. I think I saw it was close to 44,000 people died last year. So this, I mean, what a benefit this is. Now, this is deaths, not to mention people that become disabled from accidents and the, and the costs associated with that. So it's, it's even bigger than this. That's a couple million. Probably. Injuries. Yeah. Yeah. Now, just putting this into perspective, yeah. it's like accepting 200 plus Boeing 737s crashing every year and everybody dying. Jesus. Right. And now if we have one Boeing lose a door, it becomes national headlines, not to mention crashing and exploding and everybody perish. Sorry to be so graphic. Mm -hmm. This is the one every two days crashing. Nice. That's what we're looking at right now with auto deaths in this country. Yeah. And yet it's just, okay, that's, that's normal. That's okay. It's not okay. It's not okay. We, we, this is unacceptable. And at some point I think, public opinion will turn on this and we will realize that human drivers should not be behind the wheel of vehicles. Right. Yep. Now there's the argument of, okay, we live in a country where there's a lot of freedoms and, and I, I get that, you know, I don't want to take anybody's license away, but there's a huge human cost to having humans behind the wheel. And that should not be lost in this discussion about, you know, personal rights and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's part of the discussion. I, I don't have the answers. I'm just pointing out that this is horrendous. How many people die on the roads each year? Yeah. I think, you know, the earlier discussion in insurance could be the answer to all this. What happens is if you don't have, if you don't drive in a robo taxi, then you're, you're going to set yourself up to become bankrupt with the, even if you have insurance kind of thing, the insurance will be so expensive. I don't know. Something like that. Yeah, and that's again where we run the risk of more uninsured motorists because they can afford it. Yeah. Right. More and then we run the risk yeah. of eventually losing our right to drive because the uninsured yeah. motorists are just causing so much havoc that gotcha. You know, you get banned. Now I think it could be in phases. I think that, that you, you can't drive maybe on the interstate. You can drive on on slower side roads. Yeah. Fine. Right. You have to look at the data, I guess, and see where where it matters. But from a congestion standpoint, it would be pretty awesome to have just the interstates being autonomous. It would be such a smooth flowing traffic. Um, you wouldn't have those stops where, you know, everybody breaks all of a sudden and then it causes a traffic jam five miles behind them. It would be a much more smooth, smoothing, smoother operating uh, flow of traffic. Okay. And the other thing is, it's not just traffic accidents and deaths. It's also from vehicle emissions. So it's an estimated 10,000 people die every year because of emissions from vehicles right now this one isn't so obvious it's not like you stand stand by the road and get sick and die all of a sudden this is this is this happens over time but this is also not an insignificant you know thing to, to think about uh internal combustion vehicles are dirty they're ultimately deadly to people right uh, breathing, breathing those noxious fumes so to the extent we can get rid of that that's great it also makes our cities more livable um, and so on. So this is another part of the equation too. Okay. Okay. So thinking forward, um, this is from, um, ARK invest. 
they estimate that autonomous taxis could eliminate 60% or so of short haul airline flights. If you factor in the cost and the time it takes, you know, go to the airport, check in, wait around, it might be just as quick just to take a, an autonomous vehicle. Right. And they're saying wow. at 50 cents per mile, the robot taxi service would be less expensive than more than one half of short haul airline flights. <laughs> at 25 cents a mile, it could be cost effect, more cost effective than 95% of short haul journeys. So that's something to think about longer term. That's not going to happen anytime soon, but this is coming too. That's so interesting because uh, some people were thinking that this might actually disrupt um, trains. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not so, so sure so much in the U S because we don't have much of a train network here, but in Europe, sure. Like the semis, yeah. autom autonomous semis could disrupt trains because the cost is so much lower. Oh, sure. We're talking yeah, about the that, bulk of uh, shipping, not, yeah. not humans, not humans. Right. No. Yeah. No, that's coming too. Yeah. Okay. Okay. The other thing that's going to clearly disrupt is service stations. <laughs> and I built a model that I called fumes, fueling usage and market extinction of service stations. <laughs> As you know, I like to have some fun with the names of my models. This is great. But that's... with autonomy. Uh, the number of service stations that are needed dropped dramatically. Now, I calculated the number needed based on the average service station sells 1.5 million gallons a year. If you have less and less ice vehicles on the road, you don't need as many. Now, service stations are already, in many cases, transitioning to a new world. They're adding in chargers. They're trying to adapt. The question is, that's great. Will we need as many? The answer is no. Yeah. Okay. You certainly won't need as many service stations close to your home, because if you have an EV, you either charge it yourself or in the robo taxi world, it's charged somewhere else and no one's stopping to, to, to fuel up their vehicle. In that case, it's being charged somewhere else. So the need for service stations probably drops precipitously. Yeah. And I think we've done our, you, you've done analysis also that electric vehicles, uh, uh, charging stations make a lot more of an economic sense for a gas station instead of gas mm -hmm. <laughs> because the people need to stay there for 15 minutes instead of mm -hmm. a four minute you know pump and dump and go this is uh this is 15 minutes and uh they're gonna spend more money they'll sit and you know so could be more lucrative for them yeah and it might not be so much convenience stores that, that if people have 15 minutes then they can sit down and have a meal yeah. not just get a candy bar and a Coke. So the nature of people may be looking for could be different if there's a different time period involved. Yeah. So the service stations are going to have to think this through and there's certainly, you know, some that are. Okay. The other one is parking. If we have vehicles that are being utilized more, then we don't need as many parking spaces. Now we don't have a good handle of how many parking spaces there are in the U S but the estimates range between 800 million and 2 billion parking spaces in the United States enough to cover the entire state of Connecticut. Okay. So <laughs> an average of three to six parking spaces for every car in the U S makes up about one fifth of all land in city centers is parking. Okay. And 20% of prime locations. So think about if you don't have as many vehicles just sitting around, if they're being utilized more, you don't need as much parking. Therefore you can redevelop the land. You can make more residential, you know, pl places for people to live because now the city is more livable because it's less congestion and less pollution and less noise. So the real estate opportunity here is really interesting and it's going to be at the expense of parking lots. Now there's a great video I've mentioned before. This yeah. is a great video to watch America's stupidest parking secret, <laughs> um, from the, from the channel climate town. Uh, parking laws are strangling America. This is a great video. I, I recommend this all the time. It gives you, it'll give you a great understanding of the history of why we have so much parking. Like too much and parking, right? That the, the laws made it so that you don't need that many parking, but for some reason we have yeah. too much parking and now it's like, it's kind of ridiculous <laughs> and that's going to get yeah. even worse because we don't need it even more. That's right. Yeah. Interesting. And, and there was no fundamental reason why we settled on the laws that we did to calculate the number of parking spots. There was no science science based approach. Yeah. Okay. So this is a huge opportunity longer term. 
Okay. Another big implication is that we will talk to our cars. Okay. <laughs> okay. So what does that mean? Well, it's you can, it's like having a conversation with a taxi driver if you want to or not, or you can tell your car, you know, to be a certain persona, right? Yeah. You can you can talk to you can tell your car to pretend to be anybody, and it can be anybody, or you can have your car act as a tour guide or to give you recommendations. You just fly into a new city and you say, where are the best restaurants? I'm interested in the Vietnamese restaurant. What's the, what's the best one in, in town or, or on the way to my destination? Can you recommend a place for me to stop? So it's not just a mode of transportation. And actually, if you flip to the next slide, uh, just bef before you go there, Jeff yeah. Lutz uh, point, posted an, a post on X saying, imagine when your robotaxi has kit in it like this, right? Mm -hmm. And you're driving to the Chicago Cubs uh, baseball game, and then you can basically have you know the car telling you what's going to happen, and you can have it in the announcer's voice that you love so much. Mm -hmm. And then Rohan Patel, who's the executive at Tesla, said, "You hit me because he loves that exactly that. He was thinking you you perfectly hit that post exactly for me. But that's what you mean. Like you can have different voices. You can have the voice you like. You'll start to fall in love with your car. <laughs> you know, you become a yeah. developer relationship with your car. Yeah, could be interesting. So actually, <laughs> related to that is also an interesting point because some people say, you know what." I want to drive my car. I don't right. want the car to be in control. Right. And my point to them is, well, you actually may have more control. The car is doing the driving. It's relieving you of having to pay attention. But you could actually ask the car, why did you stop back there? Mm -hmm. You could have a conversation with the car about its driving and saying, you went through the intersection and did you, did you not see that horse? Mm-hmm. And, and the car could say, no, I saw the horse, but I also saw the, the truck mm -hmm. coming through the red light that I needed to avoid, right? Like there could be a, a very interesting discussion you could have with the car about the way it's behaving, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. that's interesting thing. I haven't really heard anybody yeah. talk about drive that. faster, like, take that route instead, just like you would with a, you know, a tra taxi driver. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you could tell the car and say, hey, I'm not comfortable with the way you're driving. Can you slow down? Can you speed up? Can you? <laughs> sure. So you could give it little hints like that, little pointers. Sure. So you actually have more control perhaps than you more did control. if you were just driving yourself. Yeah. So this actually, I think is a really interesting opportunity. Oh. Um, yeah. And I love on this image on the right, this, the, the way the, the kit dashboard was designed. Um, mm -hmm. Thankfully, Teslas don't look like that. Yeah. But for its time, it was ahead of its time in the eighties. I mean, yeah. First time that you can see a screen, a computer screen in a car. That's great. Right. Yeah. So taking this further then, if you can talk to your car, right? There's a large language model integration, voice integration. It can be any voice you want it to be. So it can be a tour guide. It can tell you the best restaurants. It can tell you where to go for the best hotels. It can tell you what all the other people's ratings were in the hotel. So it's like hotels.com and TripAdvisor, you know, in one, right? The people that went to this restaurant or this hotel had this experience. It can just tell you all that. And you no longer have to be surfing a web page and mm -hmm. going through, scrolling through all those comments, right? And you could ask the car, what do the people think of the bar in the in the in the hotel? And it would just go through and tell you the relevant responses, right? So we're going to see new businesses be layered on top of this. The 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 information capability is going to be phenomenal. Um, and I don't think we can really imagine today what that might be, but just like we now have Airbnb and, and hotels.com before the internet, we couldn't have imagined this stuff. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. So this is a summary of everything. The first order, it's a new business model for Tesla. It undercuts ride share. It reduces vehicle ownership. It will create economic stimulus. It increases the value of Tesla FSD capable EVs and decreases the value of everything else as far as autos, except for perhaps, you know, in the second column here, the status, but second order, OEM diseconomies of scale. As the demand for ICE vehicles shrinks, those companies suffer from diseconomy of scale. They've got still a high fixed cost, but less vehicles to spread those costs over. That will 
dramatically hurt them if they don't do something about it. Status, I think, will become more expensive. If you want to own a car and drive it yourself, there'll be fewer and fewer companies making those vehicles, and those vehicles will cost more and more. Okay, unless you want to buy a used one that everybody else is dumping because they're not as useful anymore, then you might get a deal for a period of time. But eventually, vehicles that you want to drive yourself will become quite expensive. Right? The auto industry, auto insurance industry, I think adapts. Initially, I thought that they would really struggle with this. I think it's it's an opportunity for them as much as it hurts them. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the big thing is saving lives, fewer accidents, fewer disabilities, fewer, you know, less pollution. We're taking ICE vehicles off the road. This is a great thing. Um, I believe it's going to destroy service station economics. Some of them will adapt, others won't be able to. Um, and it reduces the need for parking, which takes you then to the third order. Reduced need for parking creates opportunities in real estate, redeveloping mm-hmm. real estate. Surplus parking lots, we will need some parking locations to charge and clean the robo taxi fleets, right? That they will need some parking. But, you know, residential garages, the garage in my house, I won't need for a car anymore. I could, I could mm. repurpose that room into something else. I could make another bedroom or yeah. something else, right? Yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's an opportunity there. And just in general, it'll make cities more livable. I think it'll make living in the downtown core a lot more interesting for people. Less congestion, less pollution, less noise. Uh, we talked about how it impacts airlines, impacts hotels. It will reduce healthcare costs, less accidents. Yeah. We'll have faster, more efficient transportation. And eventually, if we get to the point where you know 95% of the vehicles are autonomous, then mm-hmm. you can start thinking about doing away with traffic lights and stop signs. <laughs> right. And, wow, interesting. And, yes. And maybe what's left is the emergency vehicles. And when a police car wants to drive, it just drives, you know, it doesn't have to worry about stopping because it knows all the autonomous vehicles will stop for it. That's only when everything is autonomous. But like you said, that's why you were saying earlier that it could be that um, there could be like zones, no human drivers allowed here. So then that can happen. Like right now in many cities, in some cities, like uh, you have to have uh, proper authorization, your license plate. Like mm-hmm. some cities, uh, only if your license plate is odd, can you come in on a Monday? Otherwise yeah. you can't come in to the city on Mondays. Uh, that's what they, they put restrictions like that. Right. Yeah. And I think maybe perhaps in certain Russia and in certain cities in rush hour, it's mm-hmm. autonomous vehicle hours during that time. Interesting. To relieve congestion and maximize traffic flow. And then after hours, you could drive into the city. Yeah. Right. Restricted Those kinds hours. of restrictions make a lot of sense, but you know, I, I'm a, I'm a cyclist. I can't ride my bicycle on the interstate, mm-hmm. right? There's a reason for that. So mm-hmm. we may also have a reason for human drivers not being allowed on the interstate one day too, <laughs> right? Hard to imagine. It's so disruptive to traffic flow. Yeah. It's hard to imagine today. I'm just saying it could be 30 years from now, but yeah, you get to a point where you want a highly efficient transportation system. You've got to get rid of the stuff that can mess it up. And, and clearly it's human drivers. Or somebody like me on a bicycle going really slow and everybody else is going 95 miles an hour. If I'm only doing 20, that's pretty dangerous. Right. So those kinds of considerations. And then, you know, we haven't talked about this yet, but productivity boosting. Um, if you're sitting in the vehicle and you don't have to drive, you can do something else. Now you may choose to go to sleep. Okay. So maybe you're not improving your productivity at that point, but you arrive at your destination rested and ready to go. Yeah, that's right. Right. So productivity comes in different forms, but even just being able to sleep and rest is a good thing. Um, or some people will choose to work. It'll be their, their you know, their office. mobile office. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then lastly, it unlocks new business opportunities that we can barely imagine today. One that we've already thought about is the idea of curated experiences. When you go to a new city, it's your tour guide, um, it's your restaurant guide, et cetera. Um, you can have a conversation with your car, it can teach you about the history, it can teach you about whatever you want to learn about in, in, a, new, in a new location. Um, that, that'll be kind of fun. I'm sure there's more, but that's the list that I've uh, come up with so far. 
Well, it's one of the most comprehensive lists I've seen so far. First order, second order, third order implications. Um, people are going to ask, what about the timing? We don't know. I mean, it can happen much sooner you realize. <laughs> but there's people that are saying, oh, Robotaxi, it doesn't matter that they unveil it this year. It's still going to be five to 10 years because of regulations. But given everything you've just said here, what people don't realize is that, number one, it's actually default in the United States that you're allowed to operate and train a robotaxi autonomous vehicles. People think it's the opposite. You need to get the city to approve it. It's not. It's the other way around. Uh, secondly, once the data shows that it's absolutely really much safer, and that might take a, a while, but let's say they do, then that's what can that's going to help change the regulations. Because I'm not saying mm -hmm. that there isn't going to be regulations so that it's going to be you know free for all. That's not the case. But mm -hmm. It's not as what other people are thinking that it's impossible. It'll be five to 10 years because regulation moves so slow. Um, yep. But what you brought up here is where all the benefits are so massive for the city, for society, for health, for uh, the productivity, for money, <laughs> more stimulus, economic stimulus. Uh, uh, you know, some this can be lumpy, like some of them will come earlier, some will come much, much later, but the benefits are so good. Is, is there anything negative? Is there anything that you can think of that could possibly be a, a really, like this sounds like a utopian future, like, like you can say a humanoid bot future could be negative, but is a robo taxi future negative? Not in the long term. I think the negative things come from the transition. Yeah. Right. There will be people that lose their jobs because they're not driving vehicles anymore. That's mm -hmm. a near term negative, but every technology in history has always created more jobs than it replaced. Okay, so on the surface of the, this would probably be the same. Mm -hmm. um, the transition isn't going to be smooth. There's going to be fits and starts. As James Dalma has said, that he thinks the biggest issue is whether the tech is ready. That, that's the biggest issue, not regulation. Yeah. If the tech is truly ready and the cars are truly safer than a human, and you know, by order of magnitude, safer than a human eventually, the regulations are not the issue. Yeah. It's the technology. And so are we there today? Maybe not quite, but we're approaching that point pretty rapidly, right? So when we start talking about timelines, when is the tech truly ready for this, right? And there's somebody on, on X, and I forget the account's name, but they, they've got a chart that shows what FSD can do and can't do and how that's changed over time. The car you know, can't go in reverse yet. Okay, so when when will it be able to do that? Because it needs to be able to back itself out of the sticky situation. So we're watching the tech improve rapidly. And, and I think that is the key issue is when the, when is the tech ready? And I think that's still up for debate. Mm -hmm. But what we have clearly seen in, in recent months is the acceleration in the tech's capability. Um, but I really can't think of any negative things um, you know, it's like saying when we went from horse transportation to vehicles. Yeah, there's lots of negatives, but overall positive. Yeah. Um, in this case, it's a very similar sort of technology, but we're, we're moving to a cleaner technology. I think the issues with going from horses to vehicles, but we solved one dirty problem of all the horse, horse manure, but we <laughs> created another problem with the pollution of the vehicles. Yeah. But it certainly greatly improved people's lives. They were able to move around much lower costs, much faster, much more efficiently. Mm -hmm. And this is another accelerant in all that. Um, yeah. The challenge is again the transition. We, we're, instead of parking, we need drop off zones. We need a place for the cars to pull over safely to drop people off so they can get in and out and not be blocking the roadway. So it's a complete redesign as to how we design our cities and and you know public spaces for, for that right if if we keep all the on-street parking spots and then just have the robo taxis drop people off in the middle of the street then that's not going to work so that, that's where the challenges i think will come is just in this transition and trying to figure all this stuff out because inevitably we will have all kinds of problems and i'm sure that the media is going to point at every single one of them and say this is why robo taxis will never work Mm -hmm. But they're all solvable ultimately, just like all the problems were with with vehicles, right? 
Um, if you go back into the history and look at the transition from horses to cars, there were all kinds of new problems that people had never encountered before. That we've we solved them all. Mm -hmm. And the same will be true in this case. Maybe it takes us 20 years to solve them all, but but we will. Wow. Thank you for doing that. Cause obviously this is one of the most, not, not the most, but one of the most uh, tremendous implications to society, as, as you just brought out, it's tremendous impact to productivity. Uh, people can relax, enjoy their lives more, less deaths. Uh, the costs could go up in some cases, go down in others, but uh, it's exciting. There's so much mm -hmm. to unpack here to continue to uh, talk to society, you know, lawmakers and everything to understand this better. But thank you for putting this together. It's a good starting point. Um, the most that I've seen comprehensive and uh, just love that last, that's that table that you put. And I'm sure it's going to be something we're going to continue to work on and keep adding and subtracting and, and so forth. But this is great. Thank you so much, CERN. This is uh, appreciate you doing this. My pleasure, Herbert. And I would just say thank you to all those on X that interacted with my earlier post on this. Yeah, Their comments and their feedback were instrumental in helping me put this slide deck together. Yeah. And maybe at some point there's, you know, version two and version three. So I appreciate everybody. You know, all your comments have been very helpful. So, so thank you very much. Yeah. And, and it's interesting because uh, if you did this and you did, we started talking about this maybe three months, four months ago, five months ago. I was like, yeah, it's fun to talk about the future. This is no longer that far away. This is something mm -hmm. we need to start talking about today. It's years away, not not decades away. Thank you so much, CERN. Appreciate you. Follow him on X at CERN Basher. Um, and, uh, he'll be on the show many times. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Thank Thanks, Herbert. I've created a website that is the most comprehensive resource for the Tesla investor. Please check it out. Simply go to my website at herbertong.com.